Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the second uh, set of uh, science classes and the webinar. Uh,各位尊敬的女士们,先生们,各位老师,各位同学,欢迎莅临第二届Satellite斯托维沃科学讲堂及网络研讨会. Uh, I'm Jackson, the uh, representative of Satellite in China. Uh, on behalf of uh, Satellite and Satellite China, we thank you all the attendees and uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, 我是孙喜,来自Satelwa中大中华区首席代表。我仅代表Satelwa中大中华区的司徒维沃,感谢所有参加者的,然后感谢您的时间与关注。So, uh, 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 well, uh, I'm going to be the chair of this uh, webinar. Um, please allow me to uh, introduce uh, this uh, webinar. So, this, uh, this afternoon, we are going to focus uh, uh, advancing uh, environmental science, uh, nanotechnology, and uh, nano uh, toxicology research with uh, nano scale dark field hyperspectral microscopy. So, um, uh, first of all, I will come going to introduce um, our speakers uh, today. So, uh, uh, Byron Chitam, uh, Vice President uh, in Seto Viva. And uh, uh, second speaker is uh, Ravo uh, Folk Ruland, uh, uh, Professor, Department of Microbiology and uh, Bio Nanotechnology, uh, Kazan uh, Federal uh, University. So, um, uh, Ben is the uh, Vice President uh, of Little uh, He uh, He thinks uh, 2005, Ben has met the uh, deployment of Satellite's hyperspectral microscopy technology uh, into hundreds of research labs worldwide. uh,纳米独立学和纳米给药在内包括环境独立学,重度纳米技术研究领域的行业标杆。目前正向病理学和光伏产业等新的领域进军。那么,Baron还负责在各个渠道的市场宣传以及信息传递工作,还为Satova
、呃、高岭土纳米粘土作为混合纳米材料的底层部分，同时呢，呃，去拓展细胞表面工程方法学，以及应用高分辨显微镜技术在文化和历史、呃、遗产文物调查中的一些应用。那么 ，Ravo 目前已发表。呃，同行评议论文五一百五十多篇，啊，十一个书籍的啊章节，包括为主要的科学出版商编辑了四本书籍。啊，下面介绍一下 Cito Viva。啊，从啊二零零四年啊 ，Cito Viva 成立于美国的阿拉巴马州，啊啊，奥本大学。那么呃，这里阿拉巴阿拉巴马州有美丽的啊呃，奥本大学以及啊，全美著名的足球。那么。呃 c i t o v i v a 也是将致力于将呃高光谱的这种成像技术应用于呃纳米科学，包括一些啊、呃、科研级的显微技术中。从二零零四年一直就为此进行不断的一些研发与与拓展。呃，那么目前呢，全球有超过四十家的实验室正在使用 c i t o v i v a 的成像技术，包括中国、呃、的一些知名的一些啊、呃、科研机构。那么这个是我们目前。呃，在全球范围，包括中国的一些参考客户的，呃，以及应用领域，包括呃比较啊、呃，我们国内比较知名的，像应用环境领域的话，就是啊、呃，中国科学院生态环境研究中心，以及北京大学、南京大学，呃，包括一些国外的知名企企业，包括默克、强生，包括一些啊。呃嗯，一些机构包括 EPA 啊、NASA， 包括这个 NIH 啊，以及一些斯坦福、杜克等知名大学。啊，那么 c i t o v a 作为全球高光谱纳米尺度的显微成像领域的领头羊，那么也是从多年的一些生产包括研发经验中，不断的去呃探索一些，比如说去融入多种功能的这种模块化，做成一些系统集成的一些啊功能性产品。那么同时呢，也会。将一些实验室的整体去提供一些实验室的整体的解决方案，同时包括相关设备的开发与应用。那么目前在中国市场呢，同时也加入了就是技术推广与服务，包括学术会议与沙龙，包括一些啊学术咨询服务。So uh uh so next step, I will uh leave time for Brian. So uh 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 he will introduce our uh technology the uh the company uh in 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 US. Um. Okay, Jack. Thank you very much. Yes. So, um, yes. I will. I will. Uh, I will. I will begin. Yeah. Please. Okay. And、uh, start、uh, by by saying thank you very much, Jack, for for helping to organize、uh, the session.、Uh, and as Jack mentioned,、uh, my name is is Byron Cheatham. And I'm vice president at Cytoviva, and of course we're we're very pleased、uh, this afternoon to be joined、uh, by Dr. Rawa Fakrulin.、Uh, Dr. Fakrulin has published many groundbreaking methods papers utilizing the Cytoviva technology, and he will present、uh, a detailed overview of some of his research interest in environmental nanotoxicology. Uh, and and with、uh, with publications and data that、uh, that include、uh, the site of Eva Darkfield hyperspectral microscope. Before Dr. Fakrulin begins, however,、um, I'm going to take you through a, a brief overview of the technology itself.、Uh, describe just at a very high level its functionality uh, and uh, and 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 how it works and and how it operates. And so with that. Get started. Before we get started, though, and 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 Jack mentioned this、uh, to to a degree with the introduction of the speakers and and Sada Viva, I'll provide the overview, and and uh, Dr. Uh, Fakrulin will will cover a detailed application review.、Um, you also have the ability to、uh, to type questions uh, into the uh, uh, webinar uh, Zoom meeting. After、uh, Dr. Fakrulin has finished,、uh, we will have a question and, and answer session、uh, as well, and, and、uh, that will be led by myself and, and, and Jack as well as Dr. Fakrulin.、Um, I want to start by providing you with just a, a brief overview of uh, what uh, the Site of Eva technology、uh, does at, at a very high level and a core essence. 
um, before we talk about the technology itself. There are three major elements in terms of functionality with this technology. And the first is the ability to observe nanoscale elements that are interacting with either labeled or unlabeled biological or material matrices. And a key element here is that the, it's the ability to observe uh, both nanomaterials and biological elements without any special sample preparation required. And, and, and to show that as an example, we can see here uh, Bacillus subtilis. Uh, these are, are, are bacteria. Uh, and these are bacteria that have uh, that are interacting with silver nanoparticles. Silver nanoparticles are, are known to be uh, efficient antimicrobial agents, and so the study of silver nanoparticles interacting with uh, pathogens such as the Bacillus subtilis uh, is is a very relevant uh, field of study. And here in this image, this is a a 400 uh, x zoom hyperspectral image. And you can see the small blue punctate areas here in the image are silver nanoparticles. And then of course you can see uh, the bacteria and the form of the bacteria. Important to note that there is no special sample preparation required in order for you to be able to see, observe the nanoparticles and observe uh, the um, bacterial elements that are in the sample. Uh, and the ability to observe that is, is very uh, qualitative in nature. With dark field hyperspectral microscopy, you also have the ability at the individual pixel level to measure either the Raleigh or me scatter uh, spectral response of these nanoscale samples. Either in the case of these silver nanoparticles, we're measuring the surface plasmon resonance. In the case of other samples, uh, you may be measuring fluorescence emission. For example, if a quantum dot was in the sample, the quantum dot produces a fluorescence emission, and that can be measured as well, or just the simple scatter, as you would see from the membrane of the bacteria in this case. And so if we look here in the bottom graph, we see the dark blue uh, curve which is representative of the isolated uh, silver nanoparticle that we see that I'm showing here. If we look at uh, the me scatter of the bacterial membrane, we see it represented here in white from this area, right? These are two very different spectral curves. However, if we look at the spectral curve of the bacteria here that is interacting with the Bacillus subtilis bacteria, we see in the light blue, its spectral curve, and it represents a hybrid of the two spectral curves of the, of the uh, uh, silver nanoparticles and of the E. coli, which is representative of the fact that this nanoparticle is in fact uh, interacting with uh, the E. coli. So if you have the ability to observe uh, these materials in very high spatial resolution, and you have the ability to measure their pixel level uh, 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 scatter or, or um, surface plasmon resonance or emission, then you can conduct detailed uh, spectral analysis and spectral mapping of these nanoscale elements in the cells and tissue and other environments. Uh, I, I want to show you uh, just a, a, a photograph of what the system looks like uh, that we'll be describing here. And you can see that the system is a basic research-grade optical microscope at its core essence, okay? Uh, and, and so typically, we provide these systems as complete solutions uh, for a research lab that includes the full system includes installation and training and application training as well when it's provided. Um, and it can operate in a number of different modalities uh, for the hyperspectral imaging. It can operate in transmitted bright field and in transmitted enhanced dark field microscopy. Uh, this is important because let's say, for example, if you had a uh, pathology related application that you wanted to study, 
uh, with H and E stains, then a transmitted bright field application may work better than, for example, an enhanced dark field. But also, there is the case that you may be working on substrates uh, that are uh, opaque, maybe a silica um, substrate, for example. In that case, you would want to work in reflected bright field or dark field microscopy mode. But also, you can work uh, in fluorescence mode uh, for um, microscopy as well. And for the hyperspectral imaging capability, it operates in most nanoscale. Uh, 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 sample uh, research uh, focuses in the visible near infrared, but it can also work in the short wave infrared hyperspectral imaging. And so here we see the enhanced dark field optics are in the uh, condenser mount of the optical microscope. We have the uh, spectrophotometer, uh, which is the diffraction grading spectrograph and the integrated SCMOS camera in this example, which combine to produce the spectral images that we see. The hyperspectral imaging works in a mode known as a line scan or push broom method. And so the automated stage serves to move the sample very precisely across the field of view of the microscope and the spectrograph and spectrophotometer to create a hyperspectral image that we saw earlier of these pixels. And you can see these pixels to build a hyperspectral image pixel row by pixel row, and then produce that as a full image that you see here on the, uh, on the screen of the, uh, of the computer uh, for presentation and then for hyperspectral analysis. Uh, Jack has already mentioned uh, the, the types of, of research institutes around the world that utilize the technology. Uh, and you can see that there is a very heavy focus in nano uh, in nanomaterial synthesis and characterization, in uh, nanotoxicology and environmental nanotoxicology and human exposure, uh, but also uh, nanomedicine and nanodrug delivery related initiatives. There is a, a significant uh, utilization as well. However, I will mention that there is a growing uh, field of interest in uh, other uh, areas such as photochemistry, uh, pathology related uh, and, and uh, uh, fields of study, as well as, as in um, uh, uh, wafer related uh, studies uh, where, um, where uh, quality control is being conducted uh, um, with uh, silicon wafers and, and uh, sapphire wafers and uh, related types of applications. And this just demonstrates it, the, the types of institutes where the system is being utilized. And also, as Jack mentioned, uh, it's utilized in approximately 400 research labs across the nation. And more importantly, there are over 1,600 scientific publications uh, uh, that uh, were, were published utilizing CytoViva uh, data, which is referenced in, in those publications and, and can be found uh, in, the, in the various uh, publication uh, areas. I'm going to transition now and, and very quickly uh, start by providing uh, just a brief overview of two key elements of the uh, Cytoviva technology, the patented enhanced dark field microscope optics and the hyperspectral imaging system. And then I'll show a very brief single application and turn over uh, the, uh, the presentation then to Dr. Fakhrulin. Uh, for a deep dive uh, into uh, his technology uh, applications that he will cover. First, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the enhanced dark field uh, illumination optics. These optics are very important for operation at the nanoscale in that they are key to providing the ability to observe the scatter of very small nanomaterials and very small nanomaterials as they're interacting with a wide range of biological uh, elements, bacteria, mammalian cells, uh, plant and animal or human tissue as well, okay? And so this works by managing the light from the light source in a very precise manner, such that we create a very shallow or oblique angle with the light such that the light bypasses the source light, 
bypasses the microscope objective, but the source light interacts with the sample at a very oblique or shallow angle such that scatter from the sample goes into the objective and is recorded and captured by the objective. That's the basic definition of how dark field works. Cytoviva has patented uh, enhanced dark field illumination that helps to improve dramatically the way that oblique angle illumination is presented to the sample by managing the light very precisely with liquid light guides, columnating lenses, and mirrors in such a way to create a very uh, intense shallow uh, form of illumination at about a 65 to 75 degree angle so that you have the maximum number of photons onto the sample. However, you have almost no stray photons above and below the focal plane of the sample. And this will serve to create about a 10x increase in the signal to noise ratio, signal of the nanomaterials or of the nanomaterials in the biological and background noise versus standard dark field optics. And I want to show an example of how that will look in, in a sample. And this is a paper published a, a number of years ago uh, by Dr. Kang uh, et al. Uh, at, um, in, in Korea that conduct microchip electrophoresis studies and utilize the Cytoviva enhanced dark field illumination to observe uh, superparametric magnetic nanoparticles uh, in this microchip electrophoresis environment. And the point of, of this slide is to actually show, if you see in the top, this group uh, utilized a standard uh, Olympus dark field condenser on an Olympus microscope. Uh, and it for these uh, nanoparticles and for imaging these nanoparticles. And these are representative images of these nanoparticles. And this is the measurement of the signal to noise ratio, the signal from the nanoparticle and the background noise. With the same exact samples and the same exact microscope and the same exact settings of the image capture parameters, they replace the, the Olympus condenser with the Cytoviva enhanced dark field condenser. And they saw a dramatic increase in the signal to noise ratio of the nanoparticle versus the background noise as a result of utilizing Cytoviva's patented enhanced dark field optics. In fact, they measured on average about a 10X increase in signal to noise ratio. This is super important because if you want to observe the scatter of nanoparticles with an optical microscope. You need to have the best signal to noise ratio optics possible. And Cytoviva's enhanced uh, uh, dark field illumination produces the best scattering image in dark field that's available uh, today uh, for nanomaterials related studies. With that, I wanna transition very quickly to hyperspectral imaging and, and talk a little bit about hyperspectral imaging and how it enables the spectral response measurements within each pixel of a high resolution image. And we're gonna talk about that combined with the enhanced dark field microscope optics uh, and, and show that. So as we mentioned earlier, you have the ability to capture visible near infrared or shortwave infrared images with a diffraction grading spectrophotometer mounted onto the microscope camera mount. We showed you an image of this system and what it looked like earlier, which enables you to capture the unique reflectance spectrum. So if you think about uh, the, the optical spectral response, you can measure uh, transmission, you can measure absorbance, or you can measure reflectance. And so this is measuring the reflectance spectrum of uh, the materials uh, that, that are being imaged by the microscope in the visible near infrared from 400 to 1000 nanometers, or if you're using a shortwave infrared system from 900 to 1700 nanometers. I will add that the vast majority 
of researchers that are working with engineered nanomaterials will operate with a visible near infrared hyperspectral system from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. Uh, the scattering of engineered nanomaterials, such as plasmonic nanoparticles, uh, uh, metal oxide nanoparticles, uh, polymer nanoparticles, um, carbon nanotubes, uh, and quantum dots as, as just a, a range, even lipids and, 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 and lipid uh, nanomaterials will produce optical spectrum in the visible near infrared range that can be recorded and can be analyzed quite well. However, there are specific nanomaterials, uh, even plasmonic and, 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 and other nanomaterials that produce distinct spectrum in the shortwave infrared and, and a system can be provided to capture that data as well. Depending on the objective utilized, uh, down to 100x objective uh, for magnification on the microscope, uh, pixel sizes in, can be as small as, as 128 nanometers. Uh, pixel resolution can be as much as 1,000 by 1,000 uh, pixel resolution. And this spectral data is reported in high spectral resolution, not spatial resolution, but spectral resolution, approximately two nanometers of spectral resolution, which means that, for example, if there's a change in the spectrum from, say, 550 nanometers to 555 nanometers over a five nanometer range, with two nanometers of spectral resolution, we could illustrate uh, a change in that very narrow five nanometer wavelength range. But most importantly, what really differentiates hyperspectral imaging is that the data is presented as a spectral curve and as an RGB image. So high spatial resolution of spectral data. And then as a result, you can conduct detailed quantitative analysis of nanoscale objects in the field of view that can be performed. And I'm gonna show some examples of that but I wanna show the importance of really high signal to noise uh, optical images with the enhanced dark field optics and how that can very well influence the hyperspectral data that you record. And I wanna show that by looking at a single gold nanoparticle and looking at the surface plasmon resonance measurements of that uh, single gold nanoparticle uh, utilizing uh, standard, again, Olympus dark field optics and Cytobiva's enhanced dark field optics. And just from a qualitative observation, it's very easy to see that there is a, not a very low signal to noise ratio. And if we measure a single pixel data here of the center of this nanoparticle, we see very low amplitude and we see lots of noise in the data. And if we compare that, with identical settings of the hyperspectral imager, but a change in the dark field optics to the site of Eva patented dark field optics, we see a very clean signal from this identical pixel. And we're able to go to the identical pixel of the identical nanoparticle of the same sample because we have an automated stage. And so the automated stage has XY coordinates which allow us to go back to the exact same coordinates with about 10 nanometers of step resolution. So we know we're on the same exact area of the, uh, of the sample and the same exact pixel of the two images. You see a dramatic increase in the improvement of the hyperspectral data, which is super important for hyperspectral image analysis. And with that, I'm going to end this overview of the technology at a very high level by just showing one example that would be uh, very uh, indicative of looking at nanoparticles in a complex biological environment. And here we're going to look at silla nanoparticles in lung tissue. Uh, and this is an example of an environmental toxicology group uh, in Germany that studies these silica nanoparticles and how that uh, they would be inhaled by mice and trying to understand how these uh, silica nanoparticles are co-localized uh, in lung tissue. And so here we have a dark field hyperspectral image of unstained lung tissue uh, from a mouse 
that had uh, been inhaling uh, through a respirator process silica nanoparticles. And we see in, in, this, in this dark field hyperspectral image, the, uh, the lung tissue structure here in the area, 20 micron scale bar to, to give some scale and understanding of size. And we have uh, optical spectrum here uh, in the window. The green optical spectrum is representative of two areas of silica nanoparticles that were identified in the image. And uh, then the, the red areas represent the, the silica, uh, or excuse me, the, the lung tissue. And in this case, the actual uh, spectrum was normalized against the lung tissue. And as a result, the lung tissue produces no distinct spectrum. But when you come onto an area of silica nanoparticles, you get uh, this optical spectrum mean, this is a mean spectrum of the silica in the tissue that we're showing here. You can see what looks like potentially other areas of silica uh, in the lung tissue. By utilizing uh, uh, a spectral library filter capability against the negative control, however, you can build uh, a, a spectral library of just the uh, silica nanoparticle elements and then you can utilize a, a software feature known as Spectral Angle Mapper. Spectral map all the uh, pixels in the image that are a match to the unique spectra of the silica nanoparticles in the lung tissue. So we see this spectral library here that's indicative of the spectral library of the silica nanoparticles. And we know it's the only, uh, uh, that it's only silica because this is a controlled experiment where uh, the, the mouse was inhaling silica nanoparticles and the control mouse, of course, was not. And so after building the spectral library, utilizing the spectral angle mapper uh, algorithm that is part of the hyperspectral image analysis software, which comes with the system, we're able to map every pixel that is a match to the silica uh, spectral library uh, that's been built here. So this is a very simple example to illustrate and, and demonstrate the ability to use hyperspectral, enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscopy, in this case, to identify and spectrally map the presence and the location of the silica nanoparticles, in this case, that are in the ex vivo unstained mouse tissue, okay? Uh, and with that, um, I, will, um, I will now uh, stop sharing uh, my screen and I will turn over uh, the presentation uh, to Dr. Fakhrulin uh, and Dr. Fakhrulin will, will um, share his screen and, and present uh, some specific uh, environmental nanotoxicology uh, work that he does. Thank you for attending, Dr. Fakhrulin. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Jack, for organizing this event. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay. Yes. So, uh, I I'm happy to see that uh, Byron has perfectly introduced technology. So I will skip some of my slides which are related to the uh, optical part and in general physical part of this technology. And I will mostly focus on the applicational part because uh, being myself a biologist or chemist who is not that familiar with optical stuff, I mostly value this technology, its straightforwardness and its ability to uh, find answers for the questions which we have. And with that, uh, I will speak a little bit about the alternative method. So basically, when you study any nanomaterial, it is very important to understand uh, the toxicological consequences of using this material. So uh, almost any study depends on either in vitro or in vivo tests, which can demonstrate if the material which we produce is safe, biocompatible, biodegradable or not. 
And in this case, uh, it is crucially important to understand the distribution of this material, the uptake patterns, uptake mechanisms. Uh, and to do so, we need to somehow image these processes. And uh, in this sense, mostly either electron microscopy or atomic, field, uh, atomic force microscopies are used routinely. For example, with uh, electron microscopy, you can easily uh, image and detect nanoscale particles taken up by cells. With atomic force microscopy, you can study the distribution of the same particles on the surface of the cells. And uh, basically, these methods are very important, but they have several uh, limitations which uh, we have to overcome so, somehow. So these technologies are costly, time consuming, require some elaborate sample preparation. Uh, interpretation might be very sophisticated, especially in case of uh, nanomechanical modes in atomic force microscopy. Uh, the sam sample imaging field of view is very, very small. So we can see just some uh, mic microns of the sample, square microns. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, one of the most important limitations is the fact that in this case, we can simply uh, image the particles in dead fixated specimens. So we cannot see any dynamic processes. Even with uh, atomic force microscopy, which can operate in liquids under environmental conditions, even in the in this case, some fast processes can be into those limitations of the technology. And of course, to overcome these problems, we require some different uh, methodology. And in this sense, uh, dark field microscopy uh, meets this uh, criteria. Uh, dark field microscopy is absolutely not a new method. So it has been developed more than 100 years ago. And uh, in some uh, early studies, uh, it was called ultra microscope. Uh, in biology, dark field microscopy is mostly used at uh, lower magnification. So not exceeding 400 X of the overall magnification, which means uh, 40 X magnification. And in this sense, we can see some, uh, some prominent features in some specimens which we cannot see in bright field, simply because in bright field we have this background light which uh, interferes with the specimen light. And in this uh, case, we cannot see some features which are clearly seen in dark field. And due to the Tyndall effect in dark field, we can see particles which are smaller than the resolution limit of the optical microscope. And uh, in regular dark field microscopy setups, uh, it is quite difficult to explain the results because we do not have uh, chemical mapping opportunities in this case. Uh, I will skip this one because Byron has already explained how the system works, uh, except for some important points from the practical uh, application point of view. So we have here a uh, white light source, fluorescence light source, we can get optical images and we can get spectral images. So we have quite uh, uh, quite a number of uh, instrumental modalities, one instrument. And this allows us to see small particles, nanoparticles, true nanoparticles, which are much smaller than the optical microscopy uh, resolution. And this works well both with plasmonic nanoparticles, such as uh, noble metal particles, and what is very important with non-plasmonic nanoparticles. Plasmonic particles are very easy to image. They have very strong scattering capabilities, and uh, their color depends on their size and uh, morphology. But in case of non-plasmonic nanoparticles, such as carbon nanotubes or clays or polymer nanoparticles, uh, this is not that straightforward. So in this case, uh, it is very good that uh, dark field microscopy is capable to see these particles. And as I will show later, uh, in some cases, we can not just see the uh, 
the nanoparticles as white, bright dots, but we also can see the aspect ratio in some nanoparticles. Uh, as already uh, explained by Byron, the uh, mapping, the hyperspectral mapping capability allows us to chemically detect different materials. I will just show how it works in case of magnetic nanoparticles in uh, artificial tissues. So we can get spectral responses, spectral curves from magnetic nanoparticles, pure magnetic nanoparticles. And after that, we can uh, identify these nanoparticles in uh, tissues or in artificial tissues. So this, this is not the real tissue, this is the uh, tissue engineered tissue and it was built using magnetic nanoparticles. So you can see the distribution, this uh, red color indicates the positions where we have these magnetic nanoparticles. So basically my talk will show the following capabilities of uh, dark field hyperspectral microscopy. So nanoparticle detection using dark field in combination with fluorescence, which is very important for biology, uh, hyperspectral mapping, and dynamic imaging of nanoparticles in real time in ambient conditions. So uh, I usually demonstrate this picture, which is very characteristic. It is not related to the technology purely, but it demonstrates how it works because uh, this empire of light painting by Rene Magritte apparently demonstrates uh, some scenery taken uh, or imaged at uh, dusk. So we still have sunlight here, but we have some features uh, behind the sunlight. And it, in some sense, uh, corresponds to dark field microscopy. So we have a strong light source, which illuminates the sample. And we can see the features both uh, in terms of cellular imaging and in terms of nanoparticles, which are inside this cell. So here you can see some clay nanoparticles in human cells. And depending on the intensity of illumination, we can either image the uh, interior of the cell, but reducing the strength, the intensity of illumination, we can simply see the nanoparticles inside the cell. So this technology uh, depends greatly on how we illuminate the cell. For example, here you can see the distribution of clay particles compared to the same uh, by uh, electron microscopy. So you can see, depending on the uptake, these cells uh, have the capability to abs uh, to endocyte uh, clays at higher concentrations than these cells. So you can clearly see this in dark field images. Uh, which is uh, very well corresponding to the electron microscopy images. And what is important here, you can see the whole cell. So if you look at this video, you can see how we change the focal plane of our image. And we can see the distribution of these nanoparticles in the volume of the cell. So this cannot be uh, imaged using uh, electron microscopy unless you make many, many slices, which can be done, but it is quite uh, cumbersome and expensive. Here you can simply uh, change the focal plane of your image and you can see where exactly your particles are in each parts of the cells. So these images are taken in real time with live cells. So these cells are viable and you can clearly see where the nanoparticles are concentrated. Uh, wait a second. Uh, yes. So these are uh, slide demonstrates the distribution of clays in uh, transparent Cenerapidis elegans worlds. This object is very suitable for working with dark field microscopy because uh, it is quite small, but still larger than uh, human cells, for example, and it is very transparent. So we can uh, image the distribution of clays in this case, in the worms in different uh, parts of the bodies. And the second slide uh, demonstrates uh, the imaging of the whole animal, which is taken uh, in approximately 46 seconds. So uh, the worms, they eat bacteria. And along with bacteria, they can take up nanoparticles. And if you want to investigate 
where these nanoparticles are located, uh, you, you can simply subject the worm uh, to the dark field microscopy. And here you can see how we move the stage and we investigate the whole animal. We change the focal plane to identify the locations of the nanoparticles so they can be uh, inside the worm or on the surface of the worm. And if they are inside, they can be at different levels of this worm. So here you can see the whole uh, adult nematode, which is imaged within uh, less than a minute. And uh, that is much easier rather than slicing the whole animal and uh, investigating the whole animal with electron microscopy. It doesn't substitute electron microscopy in some applications, but at least for some preliminary investigations or for other applications, it is very, uh, very helpful. Next, we turn to combination of dark field microscopy and fluorescence. This is extremely important for uh, nanotoxicology because fluorescence can be used to uh, to target some uh, biological molecules like DNA or proteins within the cells, and we can co correlate where we have nanoparticles with what we can see with fluorescence imaging. Like here, for example, on the left, we can see the distribution of silver and gold nanoparticles in human cells. And on the right side, we can see the same, exactly the same uh, specimen imaged in fluorescence. So we can see the nuclei and we can uh, find, find out where these nanoparticles are, how are they located in relation to the nuclei. Uh, the second, uh, the next slide shows uh, sorry, the same, the same process imaged uh, using clay nanotubes. So here you can also investigate the distribution of uh, uh, clays within the cells. Uh, we can uh, investigate the biological effects of drugs. For example, if we load uh, some drug into the uh, nanotubes which act like nanocarriers, like nanocontainers. And in this case, we have used paclitaxel, which is a uh, well-known uh, anti-cancer drug, which damages uh, several processes in the cells. And it also destroys the nuclei in cancer cells. And here you can see in this fluorescence images how we can uh, investigate the uh, concentration dependence of the effects of this uh, of the drug after it was taken up by the cell. So the nuclei are being deformed and we can see how uh, this affects the viability of the cell. We can also use some uh, regular fluorescent dyes, like uh, dyes which target membranes or dyes which target uh, cytoskeleton, and in this case, we can make correlative studies. We can uh, investigate how nanoparticles affect, for example, cytoskeleton or membrane integrity, and we can see where the nanoparticles are distributed. So these white, uh, white bright dots are images taken in dark field, mo field mode, and the fluorescence images were taken in fluorescence mode. And after that, we simply combined these images, merged them, and you can see the both signals in a single uh, picture. Next, I turn to hyperspectral mapping, which is important in terms of chemical identification of materials. Uh, in case of uh, Vis uh, visible light and near infrared spectroscopy, uh, we cannot always uh, understand the chemical nature of the material based on the spectra. So, unlike with Raman spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy, uh, this spectra doesn't always provide us with uh, exact chemical information, for example, structure of the molecules, but uh, as fingerprinting, this uh, spectra can be used to differentiate between different materials. Uh, it wor works very well with plasmonic particles, but with some non-plasmonic particles, it also can be uh, applied to identify these particles, and it works uh, with mixtures of the particles. So if we have, for example, plasmonic and non-plasmonic particles, we can clearly 
clearly differentiate between them uh, in a single image, as shown in this slide. It also works with uh, in case when both particles are not non-plasmonic, like uh, kaolinite, which is clay, and graphene oxide, which is a carbon uh, nanomaterial. In this case, we can uh, image the distribution of uh, clays and graphene oxide in uh, protozoans, which are single cell or organisms, which are larger than human cells, but still unicellular and we can uh, find out where exactly these materials are located you know, within the organism. Uh, exceptionally well, uh, hyperspectral mapping works in case when the samples are uh, stained somehow, so if they have some intrinsic color. Like uh, when we did uh, the investigation of uh, curcumin loaded halocyte nanotubes, curcumin has intrinsic yellow color, which makes it very easy to spectrally detect in, uh, for example, cellular to elegans, but it works uh, exactly in the same way with human cells. So you can get spectra of uh, curcumin, you can get spectra of halocyte loaded with curcumin. And after that, you can image the distribution of the particles in dark field mode, and then you can uh, spectrally uh, map the distribution of these particles within the organism. And for example, you can see that these nanoparticles migrate into the eggs of the nematodes. So there is some uh, transition from the, or from the mother organism to the embryos which is important. And for us, it was very, uh, a very precise way to uh, demonstrate the release and distribution of curcumin, which was loaded into hyoacid molecules. And the next slide shows one of my favorite applications. That is dynamic imaging of uh, nanoparticles in uh, real time. So for example, uh, this picture, this footage demonstrates the rotational motion of uh, individual haloisite nanotubes, which has a uh, width of approximately 50 nanometers and length doesn't exceed one micron. So we can, uh, we actually did this. We managed to uh, record brown and motion of such particles depending on different conditions like nature of the particles, nature of the media where the particles are dispersed. And we managed to uh, apply artificial intelligence to analyze these movements and to get some physical, in, physical insights on how the uh, media and the composition of the particles affects the uh, patterns of the dynamic uh, behavior of these particles. Why? This is important. It is important because we can use the same uh, algorithms to investigate the uptake and uh, interaction of uh, biological entities, like uh, cells in this case, with uh, individual nanoparticles. So here you can see, for example, the process of uptake of halocyte nanotubes by a live human cell. So this is the uh, dispersed human cell. Uh, it is dispersed in media, it is viable, and you, you can see how, how it works in real time. And the same can be imaged in uh, whole organisms. Like uh, in this case, you can see the uh, Brownian motion of haloisite nanotubes within the uh, intestines of Sneraptidis elegans. So basically, it is clear that not just the chemistry of the particles affects the toxicological effects, but also how these particles behave within the organism, whether they are static or they are moving, uh, they can somehow irritate the organism simply by the fact that they are moving actively. And uh, these processes have largely been omitted by the researchers simply because there is no methodology which would allow one to see uh, the movement of the particles uh, in the whole organism. And in this case, dark field microscopy provides this opportunity. And finally, I will show some uh, exciting examples of using this technology to investigate the uh, uptake and distribution of nanoplastics in uh, life organisms. So the 
Uh, microplastics problem doesn't uh, really need some uh, extensive introduction because we know very well that this is a very serious problem. Uh, and if I, I follow publications from China on the problem of microplastics. Just a couple of days ago, we had a joint review on this uh, on this uh, problem with some uh, Chinese colleagues. And uh, this problem is very important worldwide, and especially for China, you know, one of the largest producers of plastics worldwide. And uh, pollution with uh, plastics means that we need to investigate how these plastics affect humans, uh, organisms. So basically, you can take any sample, anything, water, air, whatever, dust, and you will find some plastics there. So it is important to study how these plastics affect uh, organisms. And to do so, we basically need to image these plastics. And some uh, model materials like polystyrene, micro, and nano beads uh, have been used extensively in research to investigate the uptake and biological effects of nanoplastics. And this has been done in combination with Senaraptidis elegant. As I said, it is a very important, uh, very suitable object for these studies. And uh, example on this slide, here I demonstrate some uh, results from some other groups. These are not our studies. Uh, so you can either obtain plastics with some fluorescent dyes, and in this case, you can uh, detect quite large particles, like microns. Or if you image nanoparticles, you still can see them, but due to the resolution limitations, you cannot really image individual particles. And in case of fluorescent dyes, you, you should always expect that some dye will leak out from the particles and you will get fluorescence where you have no particles. So that is the limitation of fluorescence microscopy. And there are some other ways to image plastics, like uh, infrared microscopy, especially using so-called focal array detectors. And that is a very powerful technique, but it allows you to image microplastics, which should be like 10 microns or even more in size. Or you can use Raman spectroscopy. And in this case, you can identify nanoplastics, like 80 nanometers in diameter. But you have to add some Raman markers, some source enhancers, like you know, silver nanoparticles, which is not uh, applicable for biological studies, because these particles might, might affect the biological process, processes on their own right. So we need something to uh, image nanoplastics without using any fluorescence, without using any Raman enhancers. And in this case, we can use a dark field microscopy. So here I show some uh, specimens, some polystyrene, uh, polymetacrylate, and melamine formaldehyde particles, which we used to image uh, in uh, ambient conditions in water. So here you can see the no nanoparticles actually can be seen even in advanced uh, bright field microscopy. So here we use some differential interference contrast, which is very powerful for most of the samples, but still you cannot see nanoparticles. But if we use uh, dark field microscopy and dark field, especially if the dark field microscopy is supplemented with uh, hyperspectral imaging, we can image particles down to 100 nanometers. We can spectrally identify them and we can map them in the sample. So all these particles have some distinct spectral responses, which can be recorded at spectral libraries and then applied to map chemically map, map these particles in, in this case, in water. Uh, the resolution, uh, the, the detection limit is quite low, so we did not really go down after 0.01%, so I expect that we can get lower detection limit, but simply we were not interested in this, in this particular study. And you can differentiate between uh, chemically different plastics like polystyrene, polymetacrylate, and melamine. They had comparable sizes, like one, two microns, and they uh, yielded in very, very distinct spectra, which could be used to differentiate between these particles in mixtures. 
And this slide just demonstrates the reproducibility of the spectral responses. So you can see that this is not just like results based on isolated particles. Uh, many spectral uh, curves have been obtained and, obtained and analyzed prior to mapping. And next, we moved to of these particles in uh, biological specimens, like in this case, again, our favorite uh, Sanerapidis elegans worm. And here you can see that larger particles can be seen in uh, regular optical microscopy, but still images are quite blurry and you cannot see where exactly these particles are. So first we uh, checked if we can differentiate particles from bacteria, which is uh, normal food of these worms, and they have comparable sizes. And you can clearly see here that uh, bacteria can be distinguished uh, from uh, nanoplastics. And next we move to image uh, different specimens of nano and microplastics in C. elegans worms. So you can see dark field images here, which already provide you with some uh, insights on the distribution of the particles. And then we made some mapping. Uh, this mapping further confirms the distribution and chemical nature of these particles. We mixed different particles at different ratios and using uh, hyperspectral mapping and pixel identification, we uh, managed almost quantitatively uh, investigate the, uh, the uptake of the particles depending on the initial concentration of different uh, plastics like polystyrene and polymetacrylate. So we can distinguish 80% uh, polystyrene plus 20% of polymetacrylate in a single war. And what is what was very exciting, it is quite easy to uh, differentiate between polystyrene, which was pigmented by different dyes. So you know very well that plastics are normally stained with some dyes. So consumer plastics have some, some color, they're not colorless. And the same applies to polystyrene, and we used uh, red, uh, blue, and opaque colorless uh, polystyrene beads, and we managed to get the spectra, which was different depending on the color. And uh, we managed to differentiate between different particles, both in uh, water and after these particles were taken up by C. elegant worms. So a quick summary uh, to add what uh, Byron already told. Uh, dark field microscopy is a very uh, powerful tool which can be used at high magnifications in terms of optical microscopy, which means up to 100x objective magnification. And it can practically detect nanoparticles down to five nanometers. That, that was the smallest size which we managed to get. Uh, might be uh, smaller in case of some uh, cosmonic particles. Now we can combine fluorescence and dark field microscopy in a sort of co correlative microscopy to understand the distribution and biological effects of these particles. Hyperspectral imaging and mapping uh, is a very important uh, add on to this technology, which allows chemical information to be obtained. And in our case, we managed to get uh, spatial distribution down to 64 nanometers per, per pixel. And uh, finally, dark field microscopy is apparently the only method which can be used for real time uh, imaging of uh, motional behavior, dynamics of nanoscale particles in live wet specimen. So uh, just want to acknowledge my, my team, my colleagues from different uh, parts of the world, from the US, from Italy, and from Moscow Russian Federation uh, funding, which was provided to our studies. And this is the picture of city of Kazan, where I live. It was taken, let's say, in dark fields. So we have uh, dark backgrounds, uh, bright uh, objects, in the field of view. And thank you very much for your attention.
Raul, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this overview. Um, and, and I will turn it over to, to Jack to, to, to close. But before I do, I, I want to mention that uh, uh, that, that uh, Cytoviva and my colleagues at Cytoviva have worked with Dr. Fakhrulin for a number of years and, and collaborated and currently collaborating on a couple of, of publications. Uh, and um, he conducts uh, some brilliant uh, environmental toxicology research and nanotoxicology research. Uh, and he does it at a very high level and he does an amazing amount of this research. And so Dr. Fakhrulin, thank you uh, for uh, your, your data and, and thank you for your uh, friendship as well. It's very, very insightful. Thank you very much, Byron. Thanks, I appreciate it. Yes. Yes. You, Jack, thank you so yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Ravo, for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation today and your time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And I see, Jack, that we it doesn't appear that we have any questions and answers, uh, but uh, it, it's important to note that we are recording uh, this uh, this webinar. And we will make the recording available to all uh, all participants of the of the uh, of the webinar, so that they can share the video um, among their colleagues uh, or, or or collaborators that they have. I see that there's there is a, there is a question, uh, and so um, I'm going to actually I'll uh, I'll ask the question uh, or read the question and and see if. Uh, uh, we can provide an answer between us. It says, um, it says hello. He said, um, I have some questions. Can we quantify the number of particles in the cell? Uh, can we map where they are? We also, can we know how many? Um, we need to use a reference spectral library to map the particles. So how can we create a library? Can we identify zero valiant iron uh, in the cell as well. Um, Dr. Fakhrul, and I know you know the answers to these questions as well as anybody. I'll, I'll let you uh, answer them if you would like. Um, uh, uh, thanks, yeah. thanks, Byron. Uh, so, thanks for the question. Uh, uh, first, first, the first one. Uh, we can identify the number of the particles in the cells if this number is reasonably small. So, for example, if we have, let's say, a very high concentration of the particles which was taken up by the cells, uh, it would be quite difficult in some cases to differentiate uh, between aggregated particles because we, if they are taken up, they might aggregate there. We cannot somehow prevent this. And in this case, uh, it would be difficult to say, like, we have three particles in one spot, one particle. It can be estimated depending on the intensity of the signal or depending on the mapping, but it would be, I would say, not precise. But if we have a very low number of particles, and that is sometimes very important because we need to study the effects of low concentrations of these particles. Like in case of uh, halocyte nanotubes, which we have been studying. In this case, we can precisely count the number of the particles taken up by the cells. And this can be done in different ways. So we are using the simple focal uh, in which the whole cell is different focal planes. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, Cytoviva currently provides the uh, Z stage moving uh, setup, which can do this in automatic way. So you can get this optical slices in the automatic way. We do this by manually adjusting the focus. Uh, depending on, uh, so we can we can say how many particles are there. Uh, making the pixel-based identification. So if we treat particles with uh, varying concentrations of, uh, if we treat cells with varying concentrations. 
Also, uh, there was a question related to uh, the use of a reference spectral library, yes, to, to map the particles. Um, and, and there are a number of ways in which that can be done. Uh, there is a process in the image analysis software which allows us to identify large regions of interest within a uh, exposed uh, uh, cell or tissue, for example, that's been exposed to nanoparticles with uh, potentially thousands of pixels of data. And that can be filtered against a negative control uh, to identify the unique spectral elements um, of, of, of the nanoparticles in the cell to create an, an accurate uh, spectral library that can then be used to, to map the particles. So there is a process for identifying the unique spectral characteristics of nanoparticles in unique environments so that that can be created as a spectral library for spectral mapping. Uh, and upon installations of these systems, we provide that kind of uh, uh, insight as, as part of the, the training process that we do. Um, and then finally, there was a question about uh, identifying zero valiant iron uh, in the cell as well. I know, Dr. Farkarulin, you have a good bit of experience with iron nanoparticles. I'll let you answer that. Um, actually, I think I can I can go back. If I'm not mistaken, uh, we worked with iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, if this zero valent iron is in a form of colloid part, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, here we go. You can see the identification of uh, magnetite, which is uh, iron oxide. If this zero, zero valent iron is in the form of a colloid particle, which has size uh, diameter of 10 nanometers or more, it can be identified. It, it has, if, if it is a, a soluble ion in uh, dissolved in a matrix, like uh, cytoplasm, it cannot be identified directly, but there have been studies, we did not do this ourselves, but there have been studies uh, when people identified such uh, species. You seem that maybe Dr. Fakhrulin was- uh... The interaction occurred. Can you hear me? Yeah, so it, it, we, we lost you just for a second, yes. But... Ah, sorry, sorry, we have some problems with connection here. So basically, the dissolved ions cannot be identified directly by microscopy, by dark field microscopy, because they, are, they do not scatter light with such intensity, which is detectable by uh, dark field microscopy. But if these ions might interact with nanoparticles, somehow treated with some some surface chemistry which is capable to uh, react with this ion. In this case, this can be detected indirectly. I, if, if you want, uh, I can share with Byron one reference where people done something like this with mercury. So detecting mercury in environmental samples after mercury was interacting with, uh, I think, silver nanoparticles. It was not our study, so I cannot go deeper into details, but I can just provide you with the reference. And it was qu quite clear. Right, that, that was uh, done by uh, IIT Madras, uh, Dr. T. Pradeep's group, I believe. Yes, yeah. conducted that yeah. work, correct, yes. Um, so uh, another question that we have is, uh, how do I prepare samples uh, such as cells, tissue, or microorganisms? And again, I'll, I'll let Dr. Fakhrulin, as the researcher, answer that question. Exactly in the same way as the samples are prepared for any other optical microscopy. So simple and easy. We take the glass slide, we drop 
Uh, especially not to this glass light and we'll cover it with the cover suite. Sometimes if you need, uh, for example, if we image tissue slices, in this case, we use some mounting media and uh, these uh, slides can be pre-treated somehow, but, or in some, we have uh, uh, some specimens which require interference-free media, we use extra glass light. But same as with other types of optical microscopes. I would only add that, that one of the benefits of, of, of the technique is that uh, there is no special preparation of the sample that's required for imaging. Uh, live cells, uh, they can be fixed. Uh, and of course, tissue uh, can be a wet mount or it can be fixed as well. But no fluorescence uh, uh, is required, such as with confocal or, or epifluorescence. Uh, and, and, and no fixation is required, which is a, a primary uh, process utilized with electron microscopy and other methods. Um, the next question is, uh, some papers have reported that there are endogenous nanoparticles in the body. Can this technique identify these particles and how? That's new to me um, uh, in terms of that. Um, I don't... I don't know that, that the technique has been utilized for anything such as this, but, but Dr. Fakhrulin, do you have any comments on that? Uh, well, uh, for example, uh, extracellular vesicles are regarded to be natural endogenous nanoparticles before, because they have sizes less than 100 nanometers and uh, they are produced within the organism and they play some physiological role and even you know this uh, neurotransmitters in uh, synapses they also are assembled in vesicles so if these things are meant as endogenous nanoparticles this can be identified by uh, this technology and we actually published a paper a couple of months ago on uh, identification of vesicles with uh, dark field micros, these were bacterial vesicles, but the same can be applied to uh, human cell vesicles. And if I'm not mistaken, somebody has published something on this. Yeah. And if we speak about inorganic nanoparticles, this can be identified even easily, as I presume, because, uh, you know, any inorganic material uh, provides very good light scattering. And, and, and now when I think about it, uh, I was actually a, a, a co-author on, on a paper identifying uh, viral particles, which would be considered nanoparticles, certainly, of course, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, 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 cell, uh, mammalian cell related environments. And also, yes, uh, Dr. Fakhrulin is correct, is that there are some research groups uh, that are studying uh, exos exosomes and, 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 and related uh, nano or nanomaterials, which are endogenous to the body. They're being utilized not only for uh, as potential drug delivery vectors, exosomes are, and, and the technique can allow you to observe and spectrally characterize uh, an exosomal material, a cell material, uh, and even one that's loaded with a drug, but also uh, they are, can be utilized as disease biomarkers as well. Uh, and there is a group uh, in the US that is studying uh, the native uh, optical spectrum of different uh, exosomes uh, as a disease diagnostic, but also applying fluorescent labels to them. And the idea there is, is that uh, the fluorescent labeling of exosomes produces very sharp, unique optical spectrum for hyperspectral imaging, uh, which allows for multiplexing. So you could potentially identify any of, uh, of many, uh, up to maybe uh, 10, 12 different disease diagnostics with 10 to 12 different immunofluorescent labeling of these uh, exosomes. That's, that's some work that's that's going on. So, so yes, uh, endogenous nanoparticles, whether they're 
viral particles or exosomal uh, cell particles uh, can be uh, identified. Um, and then finally, the last question is, does the detection only on nanoscale or general heavy metal can also be detected? And Dr. Fakarilla, you mentioned the, the, the mercury, but um, uh, other, other metals have the ability to, to, to be detected, I guess, in cells and tissue. Any, any commentary on that? Uh, to answer this question, uh, it is necessary to know uh, which metal should be detected and uh, in which matrix, because uh, identification in water, in search, for example, is very different from identification in cells, both in terms of uh, surroundings and in terms of the concentration of water is being detected. So uh, I cannot answer yes or no, uh, but theoretically, yes. There have been studies which uh, uh, demonstrate that this can be done, but it should be... Uh, so we can answer this question only when we know what exact, uh, what are the exact conditions of this detection. What is being detected and where? Most likely, yes. Yes. That's the, uh, that, those were the questions that, that were asked. And uh, with that, Jack, we will turn it over to you to close. Okay, okay. So um, thank you so much and uh, thank you all the attendees. So right now I will uh, uh, share my screen because uh, there are some, um, um, our, there's our contact information on my screen. So uh, everybody, if you want uh, to do some test, uh, even you have the further uh, question about this technology, about the product, you can add me uh, on WeChat. Even you can uh, uh, using our, uh, 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 like the, the, the phone number or email uh, email address. So uh, contact with us. So, uh, Yes, thank you so much. And um, we we can give you some, for example, if you are interested, we can give you some testing results. We can help you to use this technology. Actually, this technology is quite new for China. So, if you are interested in using this new technology to do some research, we are also very interested in giving you this help. So, it is like this. So, thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Baron. Thank you, Ravo. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, you guys too. Thank you All very right. much. Have a good day. Bye bye. Good day. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.